The music provided for this episode of the Tom Retro Chronicle is brought to you by the artist called Copperhead with their song called When We Do. To check out more Podsafe music, check out dig.ccmixter.org. A one, a two, a three, four, five. It is the Tom Retro Chronicle with your host called Tom Retro. Tom Retro is also known as the Retro Guy and has a very interesting angle on things like sports, music, movies, books, and pretty much mostly life. Uh, he has a WordPress account, a very funny Twitter account, and overall a very interesting guy. Yeah, yeah. And also has very interesting interviews like me. So let's head it to our very own special, very special host called Tom Retro. And welcome to the Chronicle, the Tom Retro Chronicle. This is episode 6, and I am taping this on a pretty uh, late uh, November afternoon. It's pretty cloudy outside, it's uh, pretty chilly outside too, um, but I'm not too surprised it's... Uh, November. It's uh, November 13th as I am recording this on the old uh, Fargo, North Dakota. So, uh, got a pretty, pretty, pretty good show coming up uh, for you all the, the in this episode. I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, the recent NFL week and I will talk about some of the big uh, stories from uh, week 11. And then some NBA stuff to talk about. Um, Mike D'Antoni uh, gets hired to be the new uh, Lakers head coach. Uh, apparently the uh, Lakers didn't want uh, Mike Brown anymore, so they pretty much dump him, and then they go after a, a pretty good pretty good signing in uh, Mike D'Antoni. So I will be talking about that. Uh, later on in the episode, and then I'm going to be talking about some a little bit personal. Uh, I'm starting to get into uh, the the great drink of coffee, so uh, that should be pretty interesting to check out. So, uh, as well as my uh, fascination with uh, Billy Joel uh, at this point in time so far. Uh, so uh, let's uh, get started with uh, the episode. So week 11 is already in the books. And in terms of this week, uh, this week was pretty much a, uh, pretty much a dumpster fire that uh, was pretty much bad. Pretty much bad right from the beginning. Uh, pretty much it all started pretty much... You know, on Thursday night, uh, you had the, uh, the Colts going to uh, Jacksonville, and and once again, Andrew Luck had a pretty good game, a uh, pretty good solid game too. Um, the Jaguars pretty much sucked in that one. And that score was uh, the Colts 27 and the Jags uh, 10. Uh, pretty much after that, and pretty, it was pretty much a foreshadow of what the week to come was. In terms of all the games that were played on Sunday, uh, there was actually one game that was within a margin of five points, and that was pretty much the most closest game that happened in this week. Other than that, there was pretty much like pretty much blowouts by. Over ten points, and and I think I will start off with the closest one, which was the Atlanta and New Orleans game, which for the most part was pretty good, pretty was a pretty good game when you really think about it. The 
uh, it was pretty much uh, pretty much a shootout to really think about it when you really think about it. Matt Ryan uh, threw for three touchdown passes, and Drew B. Brees uh, threw for three touchdown passes as well. And Yeah, it was pretty much it was pretty much a pretty good game. I mean, I mean there were certainly some tone turnovers. Both Matt Ryan and Drew Brees threw for uh, two interceptions combined. Um, but probably the biggest story in this one is that the Falcons got their first loss of the season, and now there are no more uh, unbeaten teams in the NFL. Uh, certainly I wasn't too surprised that the Falcons lost this one. I mean, the, I don't know, the, certainly, uh, certainly undefeated season was not, uh, in my mind when, when you really think about the Falcons. Uh, the Falcons have one of the most stellar defense, uh, offenses, excuse me, of the, offenses in the league, but um, certainly the Falcons defense is not exactly the uh, Chicago Bears or the or the Pittsburgh Steelers of the world, but uh, they're they're pretty decent on defense too, but uh, but essentially it just basically came down to uh, execution and who which team will make the uh, bigger play and pretty much uh, the Saints um, made uh, a few more plays better than the Falcons did and and I personally think that uh, what what the Packers had to go through uh, last season I I, I didn't picture the, the Packers to go uh, 16 and all but it was certainly a possibility but with all the defensive troubles that we had last season uh, it was certainly not a surprise to see us go down like that. And, and in terms of having an, an undefeated season, uh, the first loss is actually a pretty good, pretty good thing. I mean, uh, basically gives you the chance to fall back down to earth. Uh, gives your coaches time to. Uh, lay lay it on line on you and basically trash talk you or uh, go all out and say that you're 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 pathetic you have to you have to do better than that I mean I mean I'm not I mean I'm not trying to say that I'm a head coach or anything but in general it's uh it's a good way of saying let's let's uh let's get back down to earth here here uh, so. In terms of uh, losses uh, that the Falcons can get, I think I think the Falcons will have. In terms of Falcons schedule, um, um, the NFC South is not exactly that great of a division. I mean, it's it's kind of good, but it's it's actually more of a decent division. And what they have left for in terms of um, uh, schedule. They're at home against uh, Arizona. They go on the road against uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, at home against uh, the Saints. Uh, on the road against Carolina. Uh, at home against the, <clears throat> the Giants, which could be a pretty good game. Uh, I think, uh, depending on which Giants team shows up in that game, I think uh, there could be a loss in a loss column for uh, the uh, Falcons and they go on the road against uh, Detroit and they finish out their season at home against Tampa Bay. Uh, so I think uh, the Falcons can get to 14-2 and two pretty easily in this one. Um, but uh, looking at some other games uh, in this week um uh, taking a look at the uh, Seahawks and Jets game. Uh, other than the Jets getting a score on a fumble, fumble return for a touchdown, it was basically all 
uh, Seattle in this one. And Russell Wilson continues to have a pretty good season so far as a rookie. Uh, the Seahawks are six and four on the season, and and what's pretty surprising is uh, earlier in the week, uh, Rex Ryan and uh, Antonio Cromartie, if I remember right, uh, Cromartie were saying that the Jets are a playoff team, and I was pretty much laying down, throwing it down. Uh, I was basically criticizing them saying that their team is trash. Uh, other than that, um, another game I kind of want to talk about is the Bengals at Giants game. This this one was a quite a bit of a, more of a surprise than I probably thought it was because I had picked the uh, Giants to win this one and somehow the Giants uh, stunk up an egg. Uh or laid an egg in this case. Um, 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 Andy Dalton. Goodness gracious, Andy Dalton had a good game. Uh, four touchdown passes. Good lord. Um, uh, Dallas and Philadelphia. Uh, that that game was pretty much what I thought it was, other than the fact that it was supposed to be a turnover fest. Um, I thought it was I thought it was crap. I thought it was a crap game. Um, uh, it's not right awful. Uh, Michael Vick had a concussion. Um, uh, Nick Foles came into the game and had was kind of decent other than throwing an interception. Uh, but the Eagles season is pretty much done and I can't see any other reason. Uh, I can't think of any other reason uh, not to fire uh, Andy Reid. And one of the most surprising games uh, this week was the Rams and the 49ers. Now I knew that NFL games could go into tie, go in as a result as a tie, and I'm actually not. I'm not guessing or anything, but it's it's kind of cool that that the NFL has some sort of re resemblance of something that is that goes against uh, American values. I mean, for example, like an American value of that there is a winner and loser. Uh, and certainly this game has quite an interesting take on it. Uh, no team, the, these two teams didn't win uh, in any way, shape, or form, but they didn't lose either. So... So it's neither good or bad that <laughs> these two teams didn't uh, get a win or a loss. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, come on, look at it. look at it a little bit more differently. Um, last night's last night's game, which featured the Chiefs and uh, the Steelers, that one was that one was pretty much awful to begin with. Uh, uh, the Chiefs, the Chiefs actually got a lead in this game by for about 20 minutes in the first half, and pretty much after that, the Steelers won it. Uh, uh, Big Ben got an injury in the game, and uh, it was pretty much, uh, pretty much uh, the Steelers ended up getting a. Uh, a uh, very close win. So, um, looking at uh, looking at the Chiefs in this one, it can be certainly something of a confidence booster that their team won or or got a lead in this game, which which is even more pathetic <laughs> in this day and age in the NFL, where uh, offense offense pretty much rules. Uh, girls, girls dig offense. I mean, 
when you really think about it. But um, you know, I think I think it's something that the Chiefs can look at and say that, hey, you know what? This is something that we can build on. We can get a lead in a game, fellas. Uh, even though our season's pretty much lost, we can still uh, achieve 500. <laughs> get to 500 because there's uh, Because the Chiefs are one and eight, so that means they can win uh, seven games on in a row, which I don't see. I don't see that happening, but you know what? It it it, it can happen. But I uh, I'm not I'm not gonna smoke on it too much. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, in terms of this topic, I'm pretty much done with it. Um, I'm more than willing to drop. Uh, NFL week 11 in the books and just move on to week 12 which should be a much more better week <laughs> uh, in terms of watching football and such. So pretty much over the weekend uh, I taped uh, episode 5 on Thursday and it was basically during that morning uh, saying that the uh, Mike Brown of the uh, Los Angeles Lakers job was uh, safe for now and then about 24 hours later uh, Mike Brown gets the uh, gets the heave ho and gets sacked and and pretty much started the whole uh, thought of why would the Lakers want to do this uh, after only uh, five games into the season I mean this is I mean, I mean, there's still a lot of season left. I mean, I mean, when this happened, this was uh, about two weeks into the season, and when you really think about it, the NBA season is about from late October to uh, early to mid April. There's certainly a lot of chances that you will still make the playoffs. Uh, in this time, in this day and age, I mean, I mean, it's not really that hard to. I mean, it's pretty difficult to win big in the NBA, but, but if you have, if you have the right talent, uh, on an NBA roster, you can still, uh, make it the postseason. If you have, I mean, if you have a good bench. Uh, you have, if you have a quality bench and you have at least one star player and and pretty good starting supporting cast, uh, chances are you can still make the playoffs. And when you really think about it, you have Kobe Bryant, Paul Gasol, Dwight Howard, Steve Nash, and so many other players. Chances are you will still make the um, make the postseason because you're the Los Angeles Lakers and you have enough talent as it is to make the postseason. So I didn't get the whole sacking of um of Mike Brown. You know I think you have to uh, have to let the pieces work work in gel. I mean, this is not like, uh, I mean, this, I'm looking at a non-sports example. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. I mean, Rome, Rome was overall built uh, f for years and years before it became the city that it is today. And and certainly, when you have new new pieces to work with, uh, it takes a lot more time to for that to gel together. Uh, one good example is the Miami Heat a couple of years ago, when LeBron James and Chris Bosh came to the Heat. I mean, did uh, did uh, Pat Riley step in as a head coach? Uh, certainly, no. Uh, after uh, firing, uh, um, well, what I'm trying to say is, uh, did Pat Riley fire his head coach? No, no, because Pat Riley is a smart enough man to know that 
that there is there there has to be time uh for these uh new guys to gel in with the new offense and and when you really think about it it's it takes a lot more it takes a lot more time to work with that so uh in terms of Mike D'Antoni who is the new head coach for the Lakers uh uh, essentially, he is uh, 61 years old, which, which really, when you really think about it, he doesn't look that old. I mean, he looks like he's in his 50s, but then again, he has, he does have that baby face look to him, which, what sadly I do too. Uh, the thing, but then again, his he doesn't have the white hair of a Phil Jackson or a, or a Pat Riley or a any other head coach like that, but uh, Mike D'Antoni is 61 years old. He is from Mullins, West Virginia, which is somewhere in West Virginia. I don't know where it is, but uh, uh, he played for Marshall University in uh, college. He was selected in the second round, 20th overall uh, in 1973 by uh, the Kansas City Omaha Kings, which are the uh, Sacramento Kings of uh, today, and quite surprisingly, he had a 17-year career uh, from 1973 to 1990. And after playing for the Kings for four years, he was uh, he went to the ABA, which is the American Basketball Association. Uh, he played for the Spirits of St. Louis uh, for a season, and then he went to uh, the San Antonio, Antonio Spurs, which are still in existence today. And and then for the rest of his career, he went to uh, Olympia Milano, which is a team in uh in uh, Milan, Italy. Uh, it's a EuroLeague team. Uh, it's a Lega Basket Serie Three, uh, Serie A, excuse me. Uh, and then he pretty much played there for the rest of his career from 1978 to 1990. Um, uh, in terms of head coaching experience, he has quite a bit of a resume uh, to work with. Uh, uh, as long as, as well as uh, NBA, he has uh, coached for uh, Palacanestro Treviso, which is uh, Lega Basket City A uh, team. Uh, I believe it's in the same league as uh, Olympia. Uh, anyway, uh, in terms of basically NBA coaching experience, uh, his first head coaching stint was with the Nuggets for 1998 and 99. Uh, it didn't last there long. He was there for a season. Uh, he was uh, the Trailblazers head coach uh, for... Uh, season. Then he went to Benetton Treviso, as I mentioned before, for a season. And then he goes to the Suns, and he goes and stays there for about five seasons as the head coach there. Um, certainly one of his um, uh, one of his uh, best successes as a head coach. He was. Uh, head coach, head coach of the year in 2005. Uh, he then um, uh, he he actually coached uh, Steve Nash uh, for quite a few seasons. Uh, I believe it was in 2006 that uh, he was with uh, Dan Tony, and then as you probably know. Uh, he was uh, the New York Knicks head coach for four years, and pretty much the end of that uh, head coaching stint, he didn't last that long. 
Uh, of course, um, and then pretty much uh, about a few days after, uh, a few days ago, he becomes uh, the next head coach of the of the Lakers. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of move, uh, I think this is a pretty good move. I when you really think about it, um, Mike D'Antoni is a pretty good offensive genius. Um, uh, I think he's. I think I think he'll do great. I think he'll do. I think he'll do great. Uh, and Los Angeles, I think. I think the pieces that he has. I think the pieces that he has there uh, works out and works out good for him. Uh, he has uh, uh, players that have played for him, like in st like Steve Nash. Uh, in terms of Kobe Bryant, uh, I think he is on good terms with. Uh, Kobe. Uh, so I think this is a pretty good move. Um, I think it'll work out. Uh, I think it'll work out in the end. Um, uh, when you really think about it, uh, he uh, he has um, 388 wins as a head coach. Three hundred and three hundred and thirty nine losses. Uh in terms of winning percentage that is point five three three. So he is over five hundred. Uh in terms of playoffs, uh he has uh coached in fifty five playoff games, twenty six were uh playoff wins, uh playoff losses was twenty nine. So that would basically land him at uh Playoff winning percentage at point four seven three. Uh the closest that he's ever uh gotten to uh the NBA finals was uh two thousand four and two thousand five and two thousand five to two thousand six, which was uh two seasons. Uh and then he lost uh those uh from uh I believe that was against uh San Antonio Spurs. Uh and then uh uh two th uh, thousand five was San Antonio Spurs and two thousand six was uh the Dallas Mavericks. Um so uh term it, it works out. I think I think it'll be a good move for the Lakers. Uh I think I would have given uh Mike Brown a bit more Bit more time to gel the pieces together, but uh, definitely think Mike D'Antoni is quite a bit of a better, better um, ideal coach for that team. I I think it'll work. So, uh, in terms of this topic, I'm done with talking about it. So on to uh, the last topic. So as you probably already know that I. I'm getting in actually into uh coffee. Uh the drink of of coffee. And for most of my life I was I had a personal uh grudge against coffee, the drinking of coffee. I thought I thought the thing tasted nasty. I thought it was the most worst thing that people could ever drink. And but um, about a couple weeks ago, uh, I decided to, you know, give it another shot because I had tried, uh, trying to think, trying to remember what it was, but I think it was, uh, black, uh, coffee, which was, uh, uh, added cream to it. I added, uh, some, uh, sugar to it, and I thought, bleh. I, I, I honestly didn't like it. I I thought it tasted awful. So that was uh I'm trying to remember what that what year that was. I I think that was two thousand ten. Uh when I had my first cup of coffee and or some sort of some sort of um 
uh, drink that included coffee, beans, and about a couple of weeks ago, I went to this uh, coffee espresso parlor, which is called the Red Raven. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of like a teen hangout kind of something, but uh, it definitely includes uh, a lot of uh, entertainment for adults. Uh, it works out, works out for the best. Uh, so, so I decided to myself, you know, eventually I'm going to have to uh, just suck it up and join the rest of society and, and uh, get a cup of coffee. So, so I just go up to there. I ask for a brew, which over there is actually pretty cheap. It's uh, $1.75 for an uh, 8-ounce cup of coffee, which is pretty good, I suppose, but uh, pretty cheap, too. So, so I basically order it just about as black as heck. Uh, I didn't put anything. Uh, no creams, no. Uh, but I did grab a packet of sugar to it. And I pour it down. And basically once I got through the experience, I thought, you know, this this stuff is this this stuff isn't actually that bad. Yeah. Uh I mean I didn't exactly like it uh after at first I thought I had a pretty huge uh uh, aftertaste, like the aftert aftertaste was quite uh, extraordinary. I thought, um, in terms of if I had any thoughts that I was going to get sick or anything like that, but uh, in terms of that, I didn't think so. I I didn't agree with it. So, uh, and then pretty much ever since, I have been getting into coffee, and lately. Uh, going on to another subject, um, you know, you know, there are certain times of, certain times of year that you are into a certain artist and, or a song or a specific type of music, uh, for about a good, good year, uh, I was into listening to Pink Floyd. Uh, because I thought, you know, well, this this band was like totally for me. Because I thought, you know, they they the music that they played was kind of antisocial. No one, no one cares. No one wants to give a shit about you. Um, I thought it was like, yes, this is the kind of music that I wanted to, you know, listen to, and. For a uh, good part of last year, uh, the type of music that I listened to was jazz, which I still do. But uh, in terms of jazz music, um, anything from the 40s and 50s is, to me, one of the best eras of uh, uh, jazz music. Uh, I listened to Charlie Parker, which, to me, if... You could ask for a saxophone player. Uh, you would probably put in Charlie Parker and uh, uh, the big man. Uh, big man. I try to remember what his name is, but uh, uh, sh what's his name? Uh, I have to Wikipedia it, but uh, the big man from. Um, uh, from Bruce Springsteen's uh, East Street Band, and trying to remember uh, who that guy's name is. Let's see who is that guy? Uh, oh, Clarence, Clarence Clemens. Oh, okay. Uh, if you could ask for a better saxophone player, uh, you would ask for both uh, Charlie Parker and 
uh, Clarence Clemens, which is also who is also known as the Big Man. Uh, anyway, back to subject. Um, um, uh, what else do I listen to? I listen to uh, I have an album from uh, the Dave Drubeck Trio, which is called uh, the album's called Time Out, which is actually a pretty good jazz jazz album. But uh, my biggest uh, favorite jazz artist is. Uh, Miles Davis, and when you really think about it, he's he is probably the he is probably the Beatles of of jazz music. I mean, he is one of the greatest uh, uh, trumpet players that you could ever ever meet. Um, so so anyway, for the past uh, few weeks. Uh, I've been getting into uh, the music of Billy Joel. Uh, why? Why am I getting into uh, Billy Joel? You, I, I would have no idea. I would have no idea about it. But um, I don't know. Uh Basically, the type of music uh, from Billy Joel that I'm listening to right now is uh, pretty much a 1970s Billy Joel, which is uh, trying to diversify what uh, years of uh, Billy Joel. Uh, in general, I think uh, the 1976-1980 era of Billy Joel is probably the best uh, era I mean, he featured some songs such as You May Be Right, uh, Only the Good Die Young, uh, uh, Miami 2017, uh, The Lights Went Out on Broadway, uh, Say Goodbye to Hollywood, I think that was on uh, uh, Turnstiles, his 1976 album. Um, but in terms of his best album, there are certainly a lot of people that will say 52nd Street is his best album, but I do like uh, Stranger. Uh, I don't have the Stranger on uh, uh, as a CD or anything but like that, but uh, my parents have uh, or had a uh, the Stranger and 52nd Street on vinyl. And I listened to both of those records, and I thought... I thought The Stranger was a little bit more of an underrated album. I mean, I thought 52nd Street was the best uh, album that, he's, that he did. Um, I don't know, scenes from an Italian restaurant, which... Uh, that's that's a really good song. I mean, I thought, oh, man, man, I don't know, what, what makes uh, Billy Joel different from everyone else is that his songs are I don't know, they're fun, they're 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 personable, they uh they have that I don't know, they have that feel to that feel to it. Uh you know, I think there are a lot of people that will say uh Elton John uh, is better than Billy Joel. I can't, uh, I can't go wrong with that. I thought, I think, uh, I think Elton John as a musician and and such. I think Elton John has had a better career uh, than Billy Joel. I think um, Elton John's uh, amount of work is bar none compared to uh, Billy Joel's. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that will, there are a lot of people that say that, you know, you have their, you have your Elton John people, then you have your Billy Joel people. And my parents were pretty much no different. My dad was, uh, he was a Elton John junkie. Uh, uh, in terms of a vinyl collection, he had... Uh, 
Elton John, Elton John's Greatest Hits 1 on vinyl, which is a really good Greatest Hits CD, too, as well. Um, and then he had uh, Captain Fantastic, Fantastic and Brown Dirt Cowboy on vinyl as well. Uh, in terms of uh, my mother, she was she is a definitely a Billy Joel uh, girl. So, and I believe I mentioned that before that she had Fifty uh, Second Street and the Stranger on vinyl, which which are still pretty good records too. So, uh, you know, I like I like them both equally, but if you had to ask me the question, I would basically say Elm John is the better better uh better better one of the two. So um so anyway I think I'm pretty much done with this topic. Uh I think I will try to do another topic uh tomorrow maybe actually actually probably Thursday because Thursday is probably one of the more busier days of my week and Bart rightly so because I will be turning 24 on Thursday which is uh, the 15th of November the Ides of November as some people would say uh, and rightly so my birthday is on that day so I will try to do a podcast uh, episode uh, dedicating that day to me uh, in terms of that episode, I'll probably talk about NFL Week 11 picks and probably some uh, uh, birthday memories and such, and probably maybe maybe what I'm planning to do for that day. Uh, so so we'll have to see what happens with that. Uh, so that would be episode seven. Uh, definitely looking forward to that episode. Uh, definitely check that out. So, uh, in terms of uh, this episode, I am pretty much finished with that. So, I will hopefully see you all on Thursday. So, thank you for uh, listening to the Tom Retro Chronicle episode 6. So, bonjour. Au revoir.